Well, um, greetings, everyone. I'm glad that you're uh, here back with us uh, in our Forerunner School class uh, called Building an Eternal Purpose House of Prayer. Uh, really excited about what God's doing uh, through the class, but also just in general awakening forerunners to the need for intercession and for praying into God's eternal purposes that we might fill the golden bowls of incense uh, uh, as part of preparing the way for the Lord's return. So we're really excited about it and excited that uh, just the, some of the feedback as to how you are uh, jumping into this uh, kind of a new wineskin or a new paradigm of, uh, of, of praying and interceding where we move away from some of our prayer for our own needs in our own local church and just body ministry uh, in our local churches to moving beyond the walls of the church. But even more than that, actually, moving beyond the walls, focusing on uh, kingdom issues um, that uh, are focused on fulfilling the incense bowls at the golden altar and uh, focus are directed toward uh, accomplishing God's eternal purpose uh, in the earth. So really excited about you being here and excited about these uh, remaining sessions that we have in this class. We've, um, as you, if you've been doing the class, you'll know that we've completed uh, the first six sessions uh, and now we move to session seven, which is called Foundations for Spiritual Warfare. And, and we'll make a little bit of a shift beginning with this session. Um, if you'll recall, the first couple of sessions were focused on kind of foundational issues related to uh, eternal purpose prayer. And then we went into four prayer themes, praying for the corporate man to arise was one, and then uh, uh, resisting the uh, great harlot and then restraining the spirit of Antichrist. And then the, the last session that we had was on praying for Israel. So we had those four prayer themes. Uh, and now we shift a little bit into, and focus some on some principles that will help us to be uh, effective as we pray into God's eternal purposes. So we have four more sessions. Uh, this one on foundations for spiritual warfare and then the next one will be on spirit-led prayer, and then we'll move into some other uh, issues after that. So uh, a little bit of a shift, but I think it'll, this will be a very important session for us. You, you remember that sessions four and five focused on resisting the great harlot, uh, and then five was restraining the spirit of Antichrist. And both of those really were, focused, were, were of a spiritual warfare nature. Uh, and so in this session, what I want to do is I want to focus on, a, on the whole overall topic of spiritual warfare uh, to help us become uh, effective in spiritual warfare prayer, uh, but also safe. So two, two, really two objectives. One uh, is to be effective. Uh, that's uh, the primary, well, not just the primary objective, one of the objectives. And the other one, just as important, is to be able to, to pray uh, into issues of spiritual warfare in a way that we don't move beyond our authority uh, and stay safe uh, with these things. And so uh, we'll dig into that. And then we have some uh, ways that at our church, we have prayed into issues related to spiritual warfare uh, that we'll share with you. And hopefully it'll help you in your journey uh, as being in a prayer of spiritual warfare. So anyway, let me pray. And then we'll uh, jump into the teaching about this. Father, we do once again thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to, to teach, uh, to build a house of prayer in the Spirit, but focused on God's eternal purpose. And we thank you, Father, for uh, this session, which helps us to build foundations for proper spiritual warfare. So we ask for the, Holy, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you would take me out of the way and you would be the voice. I would merely be a voice, uh, a mouthpiece for your spirit to speak to the people taking this class and listening to this, watching this, that you love so dearly. So we pray for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's start out. Again, we're session seven. This is Foundations for Spiritual Warfare. Um, the first point I want to make is that we're called... Forerunners are called to spiritual warfare. We're called to spiritual warfare. 
Uh, let me start out with a scripture verse that related uh, uh, about or connected to John the Baptist that Jesus spoke about John the Baptist. It shares a little bit about his character and, and his uh, tone and mode of operation, but it also talks a little bit about uh, how forerunners, he and then for us, forerunners are used in spiritual warfare. So it's from Matthew 11. Uh, I'll, I'll start with verse 7. Uh, let me just read it. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John, talking about John the Baptist. Uh, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? He asked them. Uh, a reed shaken by the wind. Did you go out to see, to see something that was just being blown over by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing. Uh, those, who wear, those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. Uh, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Uh, yes, I tell you, uh, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom is written, Behold, I send you my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So he talks a little bit about John the Baptist, and he talks about his call to prepare the way for the Lord's coming. And of course, we, in prior classes, we talked a lot about that that forerunners are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ to make ready a people prepared for the Lord to be messengers, to be builders, master builders, to be uh, intercessors, friends of the bridegroom, all of those uh, things. So uh, Jesus is saying that about John the Baptist, but he's also saying a little bit about who he was. Uh, uh, he said, look, he's not a He's not just like a, a, a weed or, or being uh, shaken, a reed being shaken by the wind. He's not some weak type person. He's strong. He's a prophet. He's strong. You know, I kind of think of uh, some of the Western movies and you have the cowboys, you know, that are really tough guys, you know, a Clint Eastwood type uh, person. And so, uh, you know, it's that type of mentality that John the Baptist has and that forerunners uh, uh, need to have is to be those strong people. Uh, and then he go, Jesus goes on in this same passage and he says, truly, uh, um, well, he talks about John the Baptist. He says, truly I say to you, among those born of women, there's not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And then he says this, from the day, this is what I want you to see now. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and violent men take it by force. And so what do you see there? You see that uh, the kingdom experiences resistance from the demonic realm and it's, and it's those that are called as forerunners, violent men, not necessarily physically violent, but determined uh, focus people will take it and they have to take it by force. So there's a, there's a battle. That, that's the point I want you to see right here, uh, that there's a battle and people like John the Baptist, forerunners, have to be strong in this. We can't just be like a reed that just kind of blows with every uh, wind and doctrine and just goes with the flow. We, whereas much of the world is coming one way, we must go a different direction and we must be strong uh, and we must take it by force. So there's a, there's a battle uh, going on uh, there. And so we want to talk about how to engage in this battle uh, to be effective. That's the purpose of this session. It'll give us some ideas. And of course, you'll have your own ideas and own things that you do that might be in addition to this or different or whatever. But this, I just want to share it from my own experience as to how we've encountered uh, and entered into spiritual warfare. So that's one objective. The second one is we want to be safe as we do this because when you enter into dealing with principalities and demonic issues and, uh, you know, especially when you get above the demonic around this demonizing individuals and get into territorial spirits, it can be very dangerous. So we want to be very uh, careful there. Uh, Jude had a, has a scripture verse um, that, you know, I think is a caution to us all. Uh, yet in the same, Jude uh, verse, uh, only one chapter, but Jude verse 8 Yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh and reject authority and they revile angelic majesties. 
But Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, he did not dare pronounce against him, against the devil, a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile uh, the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. And so there's a caution there that, yes, we, we, we're in a spiritual battle, and we have to take it by force. Uh, but we also have to be careful and not move beyond our authority or our realm of authority so that it's safe uh, for those that are, that are praying uh, into these things. So that's kind of where we're headed. But the, but the fact is that the church is in a spiritual battle. We're in a war. We're in a spiritual battle. Um, Ephesians chapter 6 uh, talks about that. Uh, and of course, Ephesians, the book of Ephesians is the primary, primary chapter or book uh, about God's eternal purpose. Uh, and then it ends in chapter 6 with this uh, fairly lengthy explanation of spiritual warfare. And let me just read it. I, I know it's familiar to everybody, but I'll make a few points as I go through it. Uh, Ephesians 6, starting with verse 10. Paul says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So we see, what do we see here? We see um, uh, just a kind of a defensive uh, position and to be, to be safe so that we can stand firm against the, hit the devil's plans. And then verse 12, for our struggle is, against, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Uh, and so uh, another point here, we're in a struggle. There's a struggle going on between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness that is opposing uh, us. And so uh, we realize that in this struggle, we are called to war. Verse uh, 13, therefore take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And then he goes on to the, read a lot of the pieces of the armor. And of course, you're familiar with all that. But one of those that he has uh, is the sword that he tells, says to pick up. It's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the voice of God, uh, the just the uh, scriptures and, and that type of thing. But the point I want to make is that that's an offensive uh, weapon as well as a defense. Yes, it's defensive. If the enemy is coming against you, you use your sword to defend yourself, but you can also use it as an offensive weapon. So there is an element of not only defensive spiritual warfare, uh, but offensive spiritual warfare uh, as well. But the main point for right this, second, this minute here is that the church is in a war, uh, a battle uh, against the forces of darkness, and we have to go to war uh, in this. Uh, I, I was trying to think of an illustration that maybe would help explain it. Um, and I just thought of Pearl Harbor. You know, America was not interested in going to war. America was just uh, wanted to live in peace and there was war going on in different parts of the world. But we were not really interested in, in entering into that. But when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, we had no choice. We were in a war whether we wanted to be or not. We were, in, you know, we had been attacked and we were in a war, so we had a choice to make. Do you just sit back and do nothing? Or, you know, which probably what would have happened if the, the Japanese would have gone on and taken no, attacked the mainland in California and the West Coast and some of those kinds of things. Uh, do, do you just res, don't resist or do you stand up and fight? And I think that's where the church is right now is we have to, we have to stand up and realize that we're in a battle uh, and that we have to go to war uh, on that. Uh, so... There is an offensive, this is the, the point. I know probably a lot of what I've talked about, everybody understands. We're in a battle, and we certainly understand the defensive aspect of it. We need to protect ourselves, put on our armor, 
uh, pray for the blood to cover us, surround us with angels, all those things to defend ourselves. But there's also an offensive aspect of this. Um, you know, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, uh, the first prophecy in the scripture. Uh, and I will put enmity between you, and in in, uh, the, the writer is talking to, uh, about God's talking to ser the serpent and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Uh, and it's talking about the enmity. Now, enmity is just like a, an opposition, a hatred, a, a, you know, just a resistance again. There's, there's, that, there's that battle between the serpent and his prophesying about the coming of Christ, about Christ and his church in uh, a battle with the serpent, the devil, and his demonic principalities. And so there's this battle that started at the fall and that will last until the Lord returns. Now, the enemy will be defeated. The enemy will be completely routed and defeated when the Lord comes back. We see this in the book of Revelation, that the Lord will come back uh, and he will destroy and defeat, completely defeat uh, the serpent and all of his, uh, uh, his, de, his minions, all of those following him. And along with the Lord coming back will be the call, the chosen, and the faithful. There'll be a, a, a processional, a victorious processional, where the enemy will be uh, defeated. But in, in the meantime, this is at the second coming of Christ. So at the, but in the meantime, in the church age, uh, there's a battle going on. Now, Jesus at the cross disarmed the devil and he disarmed all the demonic principalities, uh, the princes and the rulers. And uh, again, another scripture verse. Let me just read that to you from Colossians uh, chapter 2, starting with verse 13. Uh, and I printed all these out just to make it a little bit quicker to go through rather than looking them all up in the scriptures. Uh, also, I can print them out on a bigger font, you know, so I don't have, I have a hard time reading the scriptures and now I'm a Bible sometime. But Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. Uh, in the, really, the whole chapter there is great. But when you, here's what Paul wrote. When you were dead in your transgressions and, uh, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, Christ, having forgiven us all of our transgressions, and he having canceled, and he's talking about the cross, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now, there's a lot we could talk about, but it would not be what we're talking about in this session. And then in verse 15, when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And so what did he do? He disarmed, he disarmed all the rulers. So even going back to the, to the fall, the, the Lord prophesied that there would be this enmity between Christ and the, and the serpent and those who would follow Christ and uh, the serpent's uh, assistance or his demonic rulers and principalities. There would be this battle going on. Ultimately, the serpent, the, the devil, will be destroyed <coughs> at, at the Lord's second coming. But in between, uh, at the cross, Jesus disarmed them, but they're still, they haven't been ultimately defeated. There's still a, a battle going on, although they, the Lord has authority over them. And so, you know, we're positioned, when we position ourselves for spiritual warfare, we're positioned in a way that we can win the battle, that we can win these uh, battles with them, but there's still a fight that has to go on there. Uh, and that'll take place between uh, up until the time of the second coming when the Lord uh, routes the enemy and wins uh, the battle. So there is an offensive, there is an offensive fight uh, that we're called to, an offensive spiritual battle. And that, this is a little bit new for some people probably, 
the, the defensive battle is probably, you know, understood by everybody. Uh, but the, the offensive one may be a little bit new. But we're called as forerunners to go to war offensively uh, for this. Um, let me just read a, a little bit from our, the notes here. This would be, uh, be on page three in your notes of session seven. Uh, let me read this. This is uh, page three, uh, point three D. Uh, Therefore, during the church age, God has left to it to his church in partnership with Christ to, inform the, to enforce the victory won on the cross. The church's work of enforcement will ultimately come, culminate at the end of the age when the dragon is thrown to the earth, possesses the Antichrist, and is defeated on the earth when Christ return. In the meantime, the church has a mandate to not only pray for the rise of the mature corporate man, as we discovered in session three, but also to stand against and resist through prayer and spiritual warfare the works of the devil. So that's, that's uh, the call there. Now, now let me read a, a quote by Terry Bennett uh, in his book, Why We Fight. He makes this point about offensive spiritual warfare in, this, in his book. He said, it is very clear here that Paul is speaking of defensive armor, speaking of Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, but he is also speaking of offensive weaponry when he speaks of the sword and other aggressive weapons in picture and type. The sword is a type representing the word of God, scripture, and the voice of God. This Paul is, is talking about being armed and ready uh, for, for offensive uh, spiritual battle for offensive spiritual battle. So, uh, so this, this is the point I've made up to now. We're in, a, we're in a war. We're in a spiritual war. Whether we like it or not, we're in it. And God is calling us to defend ourselves, but also uh, to resist these oppositions and go offensively to enforce the victory that Christ won on the cross. And forerunners are called uh, into this realm. Uh, so now, now that we have now we have that understood, I want to talk about staying within delegated authority. When we start talking about spiritual warfare, it's very important that we stay uh, in the realm of our delegated authority. We don't want to move beyond that because it's very, it could be very dangerous to do that. Uh, and we're just not called to do it either. Uh, we're, we're to stay within this authority realm. I tried to thinking of illustrations and I'll just share a couple here that might help us understand why it's important uh, to do that. Uh, and a lot of you maybe have heard uh, my story about uh, 2004 where when Brian and his wife Angie and I went to uh, the Ivory Coast in, in West Africa. Uh, and uh, I, we did not realize the level of, of witchcraft that was there and the level of demonic uh, uh, thing, issues, war that, were, that were going, went on there. Uh, and we weren't prepared for it. And uh, I remember one night, uh, you know, I don't see in the spirit, so I, I don't know exactly what we were battling, but it, I, I'm sure it had to be a some type of principality, uh, regional area, uh, entity uh, over the Ivory Coast. And, and it, was a, it was a huge battle. Um, honestly, br neither Brian nor I, we wondered whether we would get out of there alive. It was an attack in the spirit realm, but it was definitely physical. It, uh, we both thought we were having uh, you know, heart problems or stroke or something along those lines. And we, which we prayed all night. We, we uh, just got in the restroom and Angie was asleep on the bed. She wasn't uh, encountering it at this point in time. But Brian and I battled and uh, we honestly prayed just about all night long. Uh, we finally got a breakthrough about three or four in the morning uh, where we felt like we had, uh, you know, we could kind of 
go back and get a couple hours sleep before we had to minister the next day. But it was a, a really, really big battle. And so the Lord showed me through that that it was very important that we don't take spiritual warfare lightly, that we, we, we engage in it, but we have to be very, very uh, careful about that as well. And uh, just another illustration of uh, a friend that we had who's now gone on to be with the Lord, but um, he, he was an intercessor and he just, he, he kind of took the perspective that, you know, I have all authority because I'm in Christ. Uh, and so he went into a mosque uh, to just kind of bring, call, bring down or pray into it, closing and shutting down. And boy, that initiated all sorts of issues with him, physical issues with he and his wife. And so, uh, you know, we talked about it and, you know, about the issue and the need to kind of stay within those uh, realms uh, of delegated authority. So those are just some uh, examples uh, of that. But we have, to, we have to stay within the authority. And so uh, here's kind of the approach we use at our church. And, you know, you may use something differently, but, but this is what we do. Uh, one of the primary ways that we enter into spiritual warfare uh, you know, as we pray against the spirit of Antichrist and the, and the queen and all the things that we've talked about in various entities there, is that we direct our prayer, our warring prayer, to God. We, we, we direct it to God. You know, just like uh, in Jude, uh, Jude said, and the Lord rebuke you. Uh, so they prayed to the Lord and asked him to move on their uh, behalf. And so that's uh, a primary way that we engage in spiritual warfare. You know, there's an issue of opposition, of enmity between the church uh, uh, the, and God's purposes and the enemy, but we direct the prayer uh, to God rather than directly uh, to the enemy. The second thing in terms, of, again, again, I'm talking about being safe here, uh, keeping it uh, safe where we're, we're effectively but interceding in spiritual warfare, but safely is that we do not command a territorial spirit to come down, okay? We don't say, um, Satan, you come down, uh, you know, out of the second heaven. Uh, so we don't have the authority to do that. It's not time to do that. Or, or any kind of territorial spirit. The, the principality over the city of Atlanta you, we, can't, we don't have the authority to tell that principality to come down over the city of Atlanta. Uh, so we have to be cautious. We don't, we don't do that. And when people in our church get beyond that, we have to gently and lovingly correct them. Uh, I remember, this was years ago, uh, in one of our prayer groups, uh, that one of the intercessors was, was calling on Satan to come down. Uh, and, you know, uh, she probably didn't really want him to come down. I don't know what would have happened if he did. Uh, but I had, to, I had to correct her. And in this case, she got a little bit offended at it. But at the same time, it was for her own home protection and benefit. Now, the principality may not have paid much attention to it. And so it wasn't, it, nothing really happened there. But you don't know. So we, have to, we don't direct a principality to say, come down. Now, you may, you may be wondering, okay, like, the session on the harlot and the queen of heaven in you know, Isaiah 47 is come down on virgin daughter of Babylon instead of the dust. So we called them, we pulled them down. Well, when the Lord leads you that way, we dealt with that with a, a demonic spirit over a specific or a particular issue, a particular issue, uh, not to come down as from its place in the heavenlies because we don't have the authority to do that. Well, let me just give you an example. Uh, a few years ago, with the state of Georgia where uh, I live, uh, the, the legislature <coughs> was debating and attempting to uh, pass a very restrictive uh, law uh, to restrict abortion. And of course, the queen of heaven is the probably the demonic principality that would be over 
the whole, a lot of the cultural issues in abortion would be certainly one of those things. And so we declared Isaiah 47, come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon, sit in the dust without a throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, come down. But we were not praying for the spirit to come down over the city of Atlanta. We didn't have the authority there, but we were praying for that spirit to come down in terms of its influence over this issue in the legislature related to abortion. Uh, and so hopefully that clarifies how uh, uh, to do that. Um, so in terms of territorial spirits, we do this. Now, let me talk one more thing, one more point about uh, our area of authority. As me, as a, as a husband and as a father, especially when the kids were, uh, my kids were at home, I have the, I ha I'm the authority figure uh, over my family and over the children and my wife, even though we're in partnership, uh, I'm the head of the family. And so there's a measure of authority there. And so when a demonic spirit, not necessarily uh, one that's demonized, although that could be part of it, but one that's external in nature, comes against to try to affect my family, I have the authority to go to war uh, against that, that demonic spirit, uh, that force of wicked, this force of wickedness, and just to command it to leave my family alone. You have not the authority to do that and to route it uh, away from my family, from my children, and from my wife and from my family and the issues related uh, to that. Uh, let me just use this as a, a somewhat of a simple one, uh, but y you can use it in other things. If your children are in rebellion, uh, if, if uh, there's issues there, you can go to war on behalf of your family, your children and your wife and, uh, and spouse or, or husbands as well if the, if the wife is the one doing the battling. So, but when our two youngest, we have four children, four boys, when the two youngest were like in elementary school, probably at that age, you know, like upper elementary, third, fourth, fifth grade, somewhere in that range. Uh, they had some friends who would come over and play, two other boys that were their, their age. And they were good kids, and we love them and still uh, love them. But when they, every time they would come over, when they would leave, there would be this strife and contention and issues uh, that would be in our, in our home with the, with the two boys. And so finally, whenever we got to the point, we began to discern it. And finally, we just said, um, you know, every time they, the boys would leave, they played, they played great together. Uh, we would just take authority over those demonic spirits and say, no, you have to leave. You have to go. You have authority in, uh, in that realm. And then pastors who, who are over a church, uh, you have authority over that to, uh, take authority over demonic spirits that are that are coming to bind them and to uh, and to command them to uh, to loose your people and things along those lines. So we can pray more aggressively with those things that we're, where we have clear authority over. But those things like territorial spirits over a city or a nation or all that, we either need to direct it to God. Or if we do deal with the demonic, it's over a specific issue that the Lord has, has called us uh, to war against. So anyway, I hope that helps. Uh, again, uh, we're looking at ways to try to be, uh, to try to be safe. Uh, now, I want to move on. Again, this is on page five in your notes, uh, Roman numeral three, confronting the enemy in two ways. And we want to use Elijah and his battle with uh, the spirit of Jezebel, with Jezebel, not spirit of Jezebel, with Jezebel and Ahab. Um, and you're, I won't try to turn to the script, read the scriptures because I know you're familiar with those, uh, the passage of Elijah and his battle. Uh, but what you see is you see two things there in that battle. You see Elijah praying to God, as one thing. And then the other one is that you see Elijah confronting the prophets of Jezebel and the prophets of Baal. Uh, so there was a confrontational type of thing that went on there. And, and both are, uh, both are important. 
uh, Elijah, you know, he prophesied the drought and then he, was, he went away for three and a half years. Uh, and it said that he was uh, a man of prayer. James talks about a man of prayer and that he prayed fervently. And so he spent those three and a half years, he praying into this situation. And the purpose of the drought was to turn the people away from the worship of, Ahab, of Jezebel and her false religion, uh, Baal worship and the Asherah worship, to turn them away from that and turn them back to God. That was the purpose of the drought. So he, God moved him out there to work in his own life to prepare him for the confrontation. <clears throat> but also, while he was there, uh, he prayed. Uh, Elijah, here from, this is a quote from James 5. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and earth produced the fruit. So he prayed during that three and a half years, but even after he comes back, uh, he had the encounter, and we'll get to that in a second, uh, but also after he won the, the encounter with the prophets of Baal, uh, and Ahab and ba prophets of Baal and Asherah, uh, he still had to go and, and pray and birth the rain. So he still had to focus uh, prayer to God. And he, you know, he, he prayed seven times or prayed it through uh, until uh, that happened. And so there was, there was definitely prayer there uh, on behalf of Elijah. But he also confronted. He confronted through engaging in spiritual warfare. Page six uh, in your notes. He, he did a, he confronted Ahab and he confronted Jezebel and he confronted their, their prophets uh, directly uh, to turn the hearts of the people uh, back uh, to God. And so we see there that he didn't, he still didn't uh, directly address the demonic spirits. He, he addressed the, uh, the prophetic uh, people that were, folk, that were worshiping under there. So, so but sometimes there's a time when we have to go to war in the heavenlies. We have to, to deal with this, these issues in the heavenlies uh, that are influencing and hindering the people because the people were blind uh, they were blind to, uh, to Yahweh. They were blind to the various issues there and, and, and no, they wouldn't turn back. But once there was that confrontation, uh, the veil was, was removed and the people turned back and said, yeah, Yahweh is God, let's worship uh, him. And so anyway, there's a confrontation on two levels. There's a prayer uh, con that we battle through prayer to God and that we battle through confronting in the spirit uh, realm. Um, okay, now that's kind of lays the foundation. Uh, and uh, what I want to do next is, uh, and this will be the last few points, although it'll take a little while to go through this. I want to uh, deal with five different approaches for offensive spiritual warfare uh, that we use at our church, that we use. Uh, and you might have other ones. I, I'm not saying these are the only ones, but these are the ones that we we use to kind of give you some ideas of how to effectively and safely engage in offensive spiritual warfare, especially into those two overriding themes of the spirit of Antichrist uh, and the great harlot, the queen of heaven, which we talked about in prior sessions. Uh, so this is the first one is that we confront through prophetic declarations uh, and decrees. We, we confront through prophetic declarations uh, and uh, decrees. Uh, you, you know, there's quite a few of them in the scripture. And, Jer and I listed some here in the notes. Uh, Jeremiah uh, has several of them that, that are there where you see that they are decreeing and, and declaring things over uh, situations. The one that we use probably the most is a declaration and decree of Isaiah 47. Uh, I, you know, spoke a good bit about that in session uh, four, I think it was. Um, but we learned that from Noel Mann, our uh, spiritual mentor, uh, that helped us. And we've seen uh, just tremendous 
uh, results, positive results by declaring and decreeing Isaiah 47. Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. And we just declared the whole thing. And so uh, we've seen it in uh, when that spirit of Jezebel comes against us as a defensive mechanism, but we've also used it in, in an offensive way, which is the illustration that I used uh, a while back about the uh, about the, um, uh, the illustration I used a while back about the abortion, uh, I drew a blank there for a second, but about the abortion uh, uh, thing, policy, that, the law that was trying to be passed. So declaration and decrees are, are very effective. I, I do need to bring out a caution, though, um, because there's, a, there's really a lot of... Uh, there's a there's a great movement where there's where much some in the church a good good section of the church I think charismatic church are using declaration and decrees instead of prayer where they're I think the kind of the mindset is that you know we are I am uh, in Christ therefore I am the uh, authority figure and therefore I can declare and decree whatever I want to and it shall be so. Uh, well, that's, uh, in my opinion, that is wrong. That is not right. Um, a, a, a friend of mine is uh, Joel Richardson, and he had a tweet quoting Nick Uva, and I don't know Nick, but he had a really good blog post, uh, and this is a quote from that. He said this, Today, man as sovereign language even invades Christian praying. Despite its purported biblical basis, decreeing and declaring is the greatest example just now of something that in reality will only work under the anointing of God and the leading of his spirit, not at the whim of man. Now, so you can't really use decree and declaring just anytime you want to, um, but you use it when the, the spirit leads and and uh, he he we use it a fair amount actually but only when we sense the holy spirit leading us to do that and we'll the next sessions on spirit led prayer we'll talk about how to sense the leading of the spirit but declaring and decreeing can be a very uh, important way where we uh, you declare and decree the victory of Christ over a particular entity or situation that is coming to stop us from the victory that the Lord wants for us. So that's the first way. Uh, the second one is to confront through praise and worship. We confront through praise and worship. Um, you know, there's several places in the Old Testament for sure uh, where this took place. Uh, 2 Chronicles 20, where Jehoshaphat, where Moab and Ammon were coming against uh, the, uh, Judah, they were coming against them, and the Lord gave them the direction of, be a, of, of praising and worshiping uh, 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 Him. And when that took place, when they praised and worshiped through song, then the Lord set up ambushes there, and the enemy was defeated through praise and worship. Um, we see that also with David. Uh, in Second Chronicles, um, uh, let me see if I can find it here. I've got uh, in my notes here. Oh well, I can't. I, I don't find. Oh yeah, here it is. Here it is. Um, it's interesting. This is interesting. Um, it's actually First Chronicles eighteen one through eight. First Chronicles eighteen one through eight. Uh, David had, you, you know, you know the story. David had brought back the Ark of the Covenant. He had brought it uh, back, and he set it up on Mount Zion, and he opened the tent flaps so that everybody could see it. And they set up worshippers, 24/7 uh, worshippers around it, called the, you know, commonly we call it the Tabernacle of David. He set up the Tabernacle of David. But it, right after that, it's interesting. This was in. First Chronicles, uh, a few chapters uh, prior to this, but in 18, look what ha look what happened. So you got, you set the, see the picture. You got worship going on 
24-7 on Mount Zion, and it says this. Now, after this, uh, after it was set up, and it came about that David defeated the Philistines and subdued them and took Gath and the t its towns from the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab, and the Moabs became servants of David, bringing tribute. tribute. And David also defeated uh, Hadadazir, uh, king of Zobah, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing it, as far as Hamath, as he went to establish his rule to the Euphrates River. David took from him a thousand chariots, seven thousand horsemen, and twenty thousand foot soldiers. And David hamstrung all the chariots' horses, but reserved enough of them for for one hundred chariots. Uh, so anyway, what you see here's what you see: you see that the praise and worship is set up, and that allowed David to to win the battle with their enemies. The Philistines he was not, were not able to be defeated, uh, and so. He took them and defeated them uh, <coughs> with them with them. So praise and worship is a key way. Now we've used that some. We use it a lot of times in in conjunction with other methods. Um, there's a, a song that uh, we learned this from our our friend Noel, uh, and, there, and there's a song that we use. Uh, it's an old song, but it's called "Summon Your Power, O God." Uh, and we'll sing that uh, when we have, when we sense that we're to to really go to war on a particular issue. We'll sing that. Let me just read some of the uh, the, the the words from the lyrics. Uh, Summon your power, O God. Show your strength as you have done before. I won't try to sing it. Uh, Summon your power, O God. Show us your strength as you have done before. O God, O God. The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. The chariots of God are tens of thousands and thousands of thousands. Arise, O God, and speak the word, and all your enemies will scatter. The sound of war will soon be heard. A shout your warriors will utter. It's a real powerful, peppy praise song. We'll sing that. We'll sing that get with all of our hearts and, and put our emotions into it. Uh, to, for God to arise and through the worship, then the Holy Spirit arises in us and then we do whatever the Lord says. Sometimes we blow the shofar, sometimes we uh, release angels, other times we make declarations or multiple things like that. But we combine praise and worship uh, with the, uh, with, with the, the, the warring Tone. Now, of course, obviously we don't do that all the time. Most of our worship services, our worship is not for the purpose of spiritual warfare, but for uh, the praise and the exaltation of the Lord. But there are times we do that uh, as well. So now that was the second one. Now, the third uh, approach we take uh, is we, we confront through declaring the judgments written in the scriptures uh, against the enemies of the kingdom. Uh, and, of course, we talked about Isaiah 47, uh, but there's a, a scripture verse in Psalm, Psalm 149, uh, 5 through 9. Let the godly ones exult in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands to execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, and here, here's the verse, and to execute on them the judgment written. This is an honor for all the godly ones. Praise the Lord. So they declared and released the judge, the written judgments on there. And of course, there's you know a lot of scriptures we talked about a lot about Isaiah 47, but there, you know, there's that one. There's uh, uh, Isaiah 14. We're talking about. Uh, the 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 serpent um, uh, Psalm 83 we you can we use that one uh, some so uh, you know so we use those uh, to declare the written judgments uh, that again is is very powerful way of, of spiritual warfare um, the fourth one is we the, we confront in the prayer room and at the seat of the demonic rule at the seat of the demonic rule. So there are times that the Lord will lead you, may lead you, 
uh, outside the prayer room into a specific place, uh, an on-site prayer assignment uh, to pray uh, into the to a variety of, of issues. What a, again, we don't just do this. We do it when we sense the Lord uh, calling us to it and saying for us to go to war uh, and, and engage the enemy in a way such, such as this. I think in a prayer session I mentioned uh, about, uh, did a prayer assignment at the uh, at one of the stadiums in Atlanta where the, uh, where the opening ceremonies were for the 1996 Olympics and where they had set up a temple to Zeus in the midst of that. And we did a prayer assignment there on site. A couple of others that we did. And again, we're, we only do this when we sense the Lord leading us to do it. Uh, but uh, I remember we did one in, in January a number of years ago. At the, uh, on a, we set up on a parking lot overlooking our state capitol. Uh, and there was a god. There's a goddess uh, statue at the top of the state capitol, and we were we were declaring. We did a number of things, but one of the things we did was declare for that goddess uh, over the state of Georgia to come down and sit in the dust. Um, and so it was a bitter cold day, and it was miserable, and uh, it's become kind of a funny story in our family because I think it was. Uh, it was Angie's, Brian's wife Angie's uh, birthday, the actual day we did it. Uh, and it might have been the first birthday uh, that she was part of our church. So I'm not sure if that was true or not. But anyway, we did that and um, it was really uh, an interesting time. But the interesting thing is that right after that, uh, the, whoever, whoever made that decision had to take that statue down because uh, it had broken and they had to repair it. Now, I, I don't know what happened long term, if anything. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but I thought that was a sign to us that we accomplished something in the spirit realm there when they had to take that statue down, which was the object of our prayer assignment. Uh, so we did that. Another one we went to, um, this was probably the one that had the, the greatest long term effect. Uh, uh, of anything that we had done. But Kennesaw, we went up to the top of Kennesaw Mountain. Kennesaw Mountain is right near our church. It's a, uh, it's a Civil War battleground uh, site that was one of the battles over the city of Atlanta. And we did an assignment uh, related to, to that, related to that and to related to racism and just a variety of issues. Uh, and it was really a powerful assignment. And, and it, it was interesting in terms of the result of that, um, we had had democratic governors and de democratic control of our uh, legislature for uh, years, decades, maybe, I think even maybe over 100 years. Um, and so the Democratic Party had drifted further and further and further w liberal and, and left. Uh, and it was no longer the Democratic Party that uh, it had been uh, decades ago. Uh, and so after that assignment, uh, a Christian Republican governor was elected governor for the first time in forever, uh, and Republican legislature as well. And so it made a huge shift in our, uh, the way our state was run at the governmental level. So anyway, those are just some examples of the uh, praying and confronting at the prayer room and the seat of the demonic rule. And then the fifth one, the last one is that we confront by releasing angels uh, to war on behalf of God's purposes, to, to release angels uh, to go uh, to war. Um, even going back, you know, we've been going as a church now for 30 years or so. And uh, even going back to maybe five to maybe 10 years into it. So for at least the last 20 years, maybe, maybe longer, we have been releasing angels as God so leads. Now, again, we don't just do this only when the spirit leads us uh, to do it. But again, our friend Noel, a uh, man told us, uh, spoke prophetically that God had given us the authority to release angels from this house, this place. And so we've done that for a number of years and we've seen, uh, you know, effect of that. We've, 
you know, we, we release them, we blow the shofar, and we command them and, or ask them to, in, in obedience to the Lord, to go to Washington, D.C. or wherever uh, to accomplish whatever purpose there. Um, and then with, with our relationship with Terry Bennett, there's been even a taking it into maybe a more specific realm. I'm not saying it's more authoritative. I'm not sure if it is more or not, uh, but more specific where uh, just get, been given insight into some of the names and functional names of some of the angelic orders that we've been assigned to, to release. And so that's added an extra dimension uh, to it as well. And that's become a really important uh, mechanism and approach that we we have used, but uh, you can see that you can use these things in in these ways, uh, and they accomplish uh, uh, you know a lot, really a lot. You know the angels, that's been a very important one, declaring the written judgments. Uh, we haven't done too many of the prayer assignments recently, although for a season that was really an important one as well. So. Anyway, hopefully that helps. Hopefully that helps. Two objectives, I'll close with this. Two objectives. One is to help you to be effective in your spiritual warfare. As we've been called to war, to restrain the spirit of Antichrist and all the different issues there, we've been called to, to, um, to uh, resist the, the great harlot and the queen of heaven behind that and all the different issues there as well. In this war that we're called to, to be effective. These, these are some techniques that we have used and some principles that we follow to be effective. And the other thing is to be safe. We want you to be safe there. Uh, after battling that uh, principality in the Ivory Coast, uh, I want no more part of uh, a battle with a principality uh, like that. So we want, it, we want you to be safe, but we want you to be effective. And so hopefully this will help you to do that. So let me close with prayer, uh, and then hopefully you, that will help you to take up whatever approach the Lord puts in your heart to do this. So Lord, we thank you for this group. We ask that you would protect us uh, from the demonic realm as the full armor of God rests upon us and anoint us in these things, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.